Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we're going to be talking about a new set of announcements from AMD at their next Horizon event in San Francisco. As expected, the event was, well, it was mostly focused on enterprise data center and server products, which we don't normally cover on Hardware Unboxed, but AMD did spend some time talking about 7 nanometer chips, including Epic Rome and 7 nanometer Vegas. So we'll be going through all that stuff. We'll also talk a little bit at the end of the video on how some of these new technologies, particularly Zen 2, uh, might translate into consumer desktop products in 2019. But first, today's video has been sponsored by ASRock and their new Phantom Gaming range of Z390 motherboards. The Z390 Phantom Gaming 6 and 9 include a blazing fast 2.5 gigabits per second network interface, offering gamers and content creators 2.5 times the bandwidth compared to the standard gigabit ethernet. For more information, please check the link in the video description. We'll start with second generation Epic CPUs codenamed Rome and the Zen 2 architecture because the most interesting announcements relate to these CPUs. Of course, Epic is AMD's server processor line, so the specific products won't be of much interest to most of our audience, but AMD is doing some very interesting things with Roam that we might see come to third generation Ryzen in 2019. So the big update is a shift in total core count from 32 cores in existing Epic processors to 64 cores with Roam, and that's been made possible thanks to the use of TSMC's 7 nanometer manufacturing process, which is delivering a two times improvement to transistor density compared to the older 14 nanometer node. But the cool thing about Rome isn't the fact that the CPU cores are manufactured on seven nanometers, but a new IO die design with CPU core chiplets, which separates most IO functionality and the CPU cores into their own separate dies. As this diagram shows, Zen 2 Epic processors will have a 14 nanometer IO die in the center of the chip that houses the memory controllers, in this case, eight of them, along with infinity fabric interconnects that are attached to the CPU chiplets. There's perhaps a few other things in that IO die as well, but AMD hasn't detailed them just yet. The chiplets themselves are built using seven nanometers and each chiplet contains eight Zen 2 CPU cores along with a set of PCIe lanes. So while the memory controllers are in the IO die, PCIe remains attached directly to the CPU cores. The key advantage to the IO die is that each CPU chiplet will have equal access to memory. The current configuration for Epic sees each CPU CPU die get its own memory controller. So if one core needs memory that's attached to a different controller on a different die, there's a latency penalty to access that memory compared to accessing memory attached to its own die. With the IO die in next generation Epic, that issue should be eliminated and every die will have equal access latency to the overall memory pool. Of course, we don't know at this stage whether the IO die increases latency compared to a core accessing memory from its own on die controller in the past Epic design, but that's something we'll figure out closer to launch, and AMD does state the overall latency is improved with this new design. With this IO die design, AMD can now comfortably scale Epic processors beyond the four die configuration of past CPUs. So the top end Epic ROM chips will have eight CPU chiplet dies, each with eight Zen 2 cores for a total of 64 cores in the top configuration. And presumably there will also be lower tier chips with cores disabled. The benefit of using smaller eight core Zen 2 dies on seven nanometer, rather than say, increasing the existing design on a single die from eight to 16 cores, is of course yield and manufacturing costs. Smaller chips are easier and less costly to manufacture and it allows for easier binning and this will help with first generation products on 7 nanometer. As you can see from some product shots of an Epic Rome chip, the 8 Zen 2 chiplets are definitely very small compared to the massive IO die in the center which almost looks like a GPU in some ways. Other Epic Rome features include support for 4 terabytes of DRAM per socket and a total of 128 PCIe 4.0 lanes. Yes, PCIe 4.0 is supported with the new Epic processors. All of this combined allows AMD's new Epic processors to provide two times the performance per socket and four times the floating point performance per socket, though we'll get into that in a moment. Clearly AMD isn't willing to talk any CPU specifics like clock speeds or power consumption at this stage, but just going from 32 cores to 64 cores per socket is a massive 2x improvement, which is a big deal for data centers that love processing density. AMD also provided some 
some details on the Zen 2 architecture and further information on what 7 nanometers allows them to do. The big news is that Zen 2 increases the width of the floating point pipeline from 128 bits to 256 bits, which should drastically improve one of the key weaknesses to AMD's architecture, and that was AVX workloads. This should bring Zen 2 on par with Intel's Skylake architecture in this regard, which as we know is basically the same architecture used in today's 9th gen processors. AMD also improved a bunch of front-end stuff, including a better branch predictor, uh, optimized instruction caches, better instruction prefetching, and more. All of this strengthens their architecture to provide better IPC, although AMD didn't specify any exact IPC improvement figures. The company also mentioned they're working on Zen 4, which is no great surprise, while Zen 3 is on track to use TSM MC's 7 nanometer plus manufacturing node. On 7 nanometers, AMD says the new node allows them to provide two times the transistor density, provide the same performance at half the power, or greater than 1.25 times the performance at the same power. AMD mentioned this in both their CPU and GPU presentations. Speaking of GPUs, AMD announced 7 nanometer Vega at the event today, although 7 nanometer Vega will be restricted to server products in the form of the Radeon Instinct MI60 and MI50. Still, there's a few interesting things here as well. Vega 20 on 7 nanometer uses largely the same GPU design as Vega 10 on 14 nanometer, in that it tops out at 64 compute units and it uses HBM2 memory. However, Vega 20 improves double precision capabilities, moving from 1 16th rate to half rate, which is big news for compute applications. There's also support for Int8 and Int4, with Vega 20 providing up to 118 teraops of Int4 compute performance. Vega 20 includes a second pair of HBM2 controllers, beefing up memory support to 32 gigabytes with increased clock speeds of 2 gigabits per second. Then we're also getting PCIe 4.0 support and off-chip Infinity Fabric links for direct connections to other cards. Despite all of this, the die for Vega 20 is smaller than Vega 10 at 331 mm squared compared to 484 mm squared, all thanks to 7 nanometers. And of course, Vega 20 does have more transistors inside. In terms of performance, well, AMD isn't going into specifics on clock speed again, but they did list 14.7 teraflops of FP32 performance, with 7 nanometers providing around that 1.25 times gain over 14 nanometer in performance at the same power consumption. The MI25 had 12.3 teraflops of compute, so that's around a 20% jump. But for compute, the real advantage is the massive improvement to FP64, more memory and more memory bandwidth, and of course, the other new features as well. As for product launches, the MI60 will be shipping in Q4 this year with the MI50 coming in Q1 of next year. Epic Rome is currently sampling now and will be launched at some point in 2019, although AMD didn't specify. Now let's head down, well, I guess speculation street to talk about how some of these new technologies might come across to consumer desktop products, because there's a lot of things here that will eventually make its way to AMD's next gen CPUs and GPUs. However, again, what's coming up is just pure speculation on our part. We really have no idea what AMD is doing on the consumer side for certain. As far as third generation Ryzen is concerned, the big takeaway here is what AMD is officially stating 7 nanometers can provide compared to 14 nanometers. Specifically, they claim that they can get greater than 1.25 times the performance at the same power. So first gen Ryzen was built using a 14 nanometer process and third gen will be 7 nanometers. So presumably AMD will be able to achieve much higher clock speeds on 7 nanometers than 14 nanometers going on their 1.25 times performance claim. The Ryzen 7 1800X topped out at 4.0 gigahertz single core with a 3.7 gigahertz all core. So if we did see clock speeds 1.25 times higher than that for next gen Ryzen, we'd be looking at 4.6 gigahertz across eight cores and up to five gigahertz on a single core at the same power power level as the 1800X. Again, that is just speculation, but that follows on from what AMD is saying. Factor in all the other architecture improvements, and we're potentially looking at a real beast for third gen Ryzen. The improved floating point pipeline is particularly massive news, as this should bring third gen Ryzen in line with Intel's current processors for AVX workloads. It's also possible that AMD will use the IO die design, which could allow them to put, say, two 8-core Zen 2 dies on the one AM4 compatible chip. The IO die looks like it could easily be cut down into quarters, with one quarter providing two DRAM controllers, which would be well suited to an AM4 CPU. This would then result in a 16-core CPU on the AM4 platform, which would be an absolute beast for productivity workloads without needing to go to Threadripper. 
And again, going on AMD's numbers for 7 nanometers, particularly stating that they can achieve half the power consumption at the same performance, theoretically AMD could use this aspect of 7 nanometers scaling capabilities to double the core count of an AM4 chip at the same power consumption level. That would mean something along the lines of a 16 core chip clocked up to 4.0 gigahertz with reasonable power consumption. That's very, very exciting and it would certainly be interesting to see how Intel would respond. As for GPUs, well, it's a bit harder to tell how AMD's next generation consumer GPUs will go when Vega 20 announced today does not use AMD's upcoming Navi architecture that will be used for their consumer gaming line. So really we have no insights into what Navi will bring to the table. But again, we are getting a look at what 7 nanometers might do on the GPU side. Vega 20 in the Radeon Instinct MI60 is about 20% faster than Vega 10 in the Instinct MI25 for FP32 work. And AMD again says they should be achieving upwards of 25% more performance at the same power consumption. Considering Nvidia's RTX 2080 Ti is in the region of 60% more powerful than Vega 64 for gaming, AMD will need to do a lot of work on the architecture front to get Navi up to the ballpark of Turing. It doesn't look like 7 nanometers alone will get them there. That said, in terms of raw compute performance, the Instinct MI60 with 14.7 teraflops of FP32 actually beats the RTX 2080 Ti with 13.4 teraflops. So let's hope Navi can resolve some of the architecture concerns constraints that prevented Vega from delivering all of that power for gaming, because if they can certainly unleash all of that performance in next generation architecture, um, that would be really great news for gamers. Anyway, that's it for this brief look into what AMD announced today at Next Horizon. We're expecting to hear more about 7 nanometer consumer products at CES 2019, so stay tuned for that in January. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what AMD announced in the comments below, so chuck them down there. Consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can chat with us directly about announcements like this in our Discord chat. The Discord was absolutely flying this morning, actually, during the announcement, so you can be a part of that too if you want. And I guess we'll catch you in the next one.